In today's video, we're going to begin our discussion of cellular respiration. And this will be the first of three different parts of cell respiration in which we talk about how cells, and specifically the mitochondria of cells, produce energy in the form of ATP. And this is a video for the IV biology exam starting in 2016, section 2.8 and 8.2. So to begin, let's, start, let's talk about an introduction to cell respiration. Cell respiration is a controlled release of energy from organic compounds in cells to form ATP. ATP is not transferred from cell to cell, and it's the form of energy that cells need in order to be able to do work. And so what this means is that cells must produce their own ATP. And they do this by using the organelle mitochondria in order to create ATP. There's three main types of activities in the cell that need energy. That would be making larger molecules like DNA or RNA, pumping molecules or ions across membranes uh, by active transport, or moving things around inside the cell or outside of the cell as well, or actually having the cell move itself like in protein fibers. And so for all of those actions, ATP is needed. In cellular respiration, the process uh, involves the breakdown of glucose, uh, is broken down in the cytoplasm by a process called glycolysis, which we'll take a look at in this video, uh, into pyruvate with a small yield of ATP that is immediately available for use. Now our cells need lots of ATP, and so glycolysis is just the first step in making lots of um, lots of ATP. Overall, this process primarily occurs in the mitochondria, as previously said, although glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm, the majority of the process is occurring in the mitochondria. Now, during this process, something occurs called oxidation and reduction. And cellular respiration results in the oxidation of some elements and the reductions of others. Oxidation refers to the loss of electrons from a substance, or you could think of it as the gaining of oxygen or losing of hydrogen. So anytime an element is gaining oxygen, an oxygen atom, or losing hydrogen atoms, it is going under, undergoing oxidation. Reduction is the opposite. It is the addition of electrons to a substance. And so anytime an, a, a molecule is losing oxygen or gaining hydrogen, in those cases it is being reduced. And so here's an example. Here we have NAD plus and two hydrogen ions. And that results to produce NADH and H+. Plus. The NAD, NAD plus accepts two electrons from the substance being reduced, and so the NAD accepts electron from the splitting of one hydrogen atom into a proton and an electron. And so what this produces is NADH um, and H+. Plus. So the hydrogen here, the two hydrogens bonded together, one of them is connecting to the NAD plus as well as an electron, and so that leaves us with NADH and a hydrogen that has a positive charge. In this case, the NAD plus is gaining hydrogen, so it would be being reduced, and the hydrogen atoms are losing hydrogen, so it would be oxidized. There's two different forms of respiration that occur. Anaerobic, meaning without oxygen, or in breakdown of glucose in the absence of oxygen, and aerobic respiration. First, let's take a look at anaerobic respiration, and this produces a small yield of ATP, about two ATPs. And this is useful in a couple different situations, when there's a short but rapid burst of ATP needed, when oxygen supplies actually run out, or if there's an environment deficient in oxygen. And this can occur in prokaryotic organisms that live in environments without oxygen, um, like the deep sea vents uh, in which the bacteria use actually sulfur um, in order to produce their energy. Um, in this case, the product of um, glycolysis, pyruvate, actually stays in the cytoplasm. As we'll see in aerobic respiration, this product of pyruvate uh, actually moves on then into the mitochondria. In humans, the pyruvate in anaerobic respiration is converted into lac lactic acid, and in yeast, the pyruvate is converted into CO2 and alcohol, in which no ATP is actually produced. So let's take a uh, look at an image of this, uh, comparing plants and animals. In animals, we have glucose here, and the process of glycolysis uses 2 ATP, and it produces pyruvate, and in no oxygen, that actually gets converted into lactic acid. In plants, glucose goes through glycolysis, 2 ATP are used, and if there's no oxygen present, this produces ethanol and CO2. It's a little bit different just depending on the organism that we're looking at. Let's take a look at aerobic respiration, and in this 
situation, uh, it's still the breakdown of glucose, but this time it's the presence of oxygen. And this actually can yield a large amount of ATP, about 30 plus, 32 to 34 plus. It occurs primarily in the mitochondria, and the pro product of glycolysis, pyruvate, is moved into the mitochondria in this case. Pyruvate is broken down to release hydrogen ions, releasing a carbon dioxide, water, and a large amount of ATP. And there's multiple steps to aerobic respiration, starting with glycolysis, and then connecting to the link reaction, Krebs cycle, and electron transfer chain. In this video, we're going to look at a part of the aerobic respiration, glycolysis, which is also anaerobic. And in future videos, we'll look at the link reaction, Krebs cycle, and electron transfer chain. And so as we talked about, the majority of cellular respiration is occurring in the mitochondria. And this is an electron micrograph of a mitochondria. Let's look at some of the different structures. Mitochondria have both an inner and an outer membrane, very similar to the cell itself. And one of the pieces of evidence that suggests the endosymbiotic theory of small cells, which um, are now organelles, being small prokaryotes that were engulfed by others. It has these small protubing folds that you can kind of see in the image here on the inside of the organelle. And these are called cristi. And basically the purpose of them is to increase the overall surface area in order for reactions to occur. The area in between the cristi and the inside of the mitochondria, similar to the cytoplasm, is called the matrix. And then there's an inner membrane space between the inner and outer membrane. We'll take a closer look at some of these structures a little bit later in future videos. So overall, for the process of cellular respiration, the inputs, what goes into the process, is one glucose molecule, C6H12O6, and six oxygen molecules. This is actually the reason why you need to take a breath. When you breathe, you're bringing in oxygen that your body, and more specifically your cells and the mitochondria, need in order to convert glucose, sugar, from food that you eat, into ATP, energy that the body can use. And so the outputs of this process is CO2. You breathe out that CO2, you release some water, and you get a high yield of ATP. During the process of, phos uh, of, photos of cellular respiration, excuse me, the process of phosphorylation occurs in a number of different steps. And this is the process of adding a phosphate molecule to another molecule. Um, and we'll see this happen actually in glycolysis when we take a look at it here in more detail in just a second. What this does is it re results in a less stable molecule. So when that phosphate is added, it results in a slightly less stable molecule. We've previously talked about ATP, you've probably heard of ATP before, and in this video, and ATP stands for adenine triphosphate, meaning it's a molecule that has three phosphates on it. ADP is a different form where it has di, or two, phosphates attached to it. And so that ATP is rather unstable, and it releases a phosphate to provide energy, and that's the energy that cells use in order to be able to do work. ATP hydrolysis is an exergonic reaction, meaning it releases energy out into the environment when it releases that phosphate. So we're going to see this phosphorylation occur in a number of different steps in the process of cellular respiration. So let's take a look at the process of glycolysis in more detail. This produces a small net gain of ATP without the use of oxygen. So actually no oxygen is required. And it converts glucose to two molecules of pyruvate. And so here's a, a more simplified image that's kind of breaking down what's happening. In the first phase, energy is actually used. When we start with a molecule of glucose, two ATP are used in order to connect those two uh, phosphates to the molecule. And some different enzymes actually change the structure, and the glucose molecule gets rearranged into the format of fructose. And previously we talked about glucose and fructose both being monosaccharides. They are both simple or monosaccharide sugars that contain six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. And so now in this case, this fructose has two phosphates attached to it, at the specifically the first and six carbons. That's what this fructose 1,6-biphosphate means. It has two phosphates attached to it at the first and the six carbons. Now, this fructose gets split into two. And this occurs by other enzymes. And so we have two molecules, each that have three carbons and a phosphate to them. The energy payoff phase portion involves ATP actually being produced. And so to each of these three carbon molecules, a additional, an additional phosphate is being added. And this is not from ATP. An additional phosphate is being added. And it produces, in doing so, and in the structural rearrangement of this molecule, it produces an NADH and an NADH. So there's two NADH molecules and two hydrogen ions. These are both going to be used a little bit later on in the process of cellular respiration when we get to the electron transport chain. They're actually really important and necessary. Additionally, the phosphates that were on the molecule actually get removed. And this happens or occurs twice. And so two ADP are used, and it releases two ATP. And so what we end with is a three-carbon molecule 
that has no phosphates attached to it, and we call those pyruvate. Also, we have some net products of two ATP overall, because two are produced here, two are produced here, but we used two previously, so we have a two net ATP overall, and two NADH and two H+. All of these reactions that occur represent a metabolic reaction. All of these reactions put together make up or represent a metabolic reaction, as does the whole process of cellular respiration. Now, here's another image that is in far more detail that shows all of the steps that are occurring and the different enzymes that are necessary. If you do a quick Google search on Wikipedia, you'll be able to find this image from Wikipedia. It's very helpful if you want to see the process in further detail. What I want to do next is provide you a step-by-step -step list of what's happening in glycolysis that also includes some of the enzyme names that are being used that will help you to be able to follow the process maybe a little bit more easily. And so the first step to this process is phosphate from ATP is transferred to glucose or another 6-carbon hexose sugar, um, and this makes the glucose a little bit more reactive. The glucose is converted to fructose, and the enzyme, enzyme phosphofructokinase or kinase transfers a second phosphate to the fructose molecule from ATP. So that fructose now is a 1,6-biphosphate. Another enzyme called aldolase splits or cleaves the sugar into two different three carbon molecules. And so this is the splitting of those two molecules. We're now in the energy payoff phase. Each of those three carbon molecules is oxidized, meaning it's losing electrons, by removing two hydrogen molecules from each molecule, and one phosphate is attached to each three carbon sugar. NAD plus accepts one hydrogen from each three carbon molecule to create NADH, and two hydrogen ions are produced. And lastly, two phosphates from step five uh, from each molecule are added to ADP to make two ATP molecules, and what is left is two molecules of pyruvate, that three carbon molecule. And so kind of to recap glycolysis, it occurs in the cytoplasm. The input is a glucose or a hexose sugar, that means a sugar with six carbons. Two ATP molecules, two NAD+, and the outputs are two pyruvates, two water molecules, two ATP net, and two NADH, and two H+. We'll talk about and look at in the next video, Respiration Part 2, how that pyruvate is used in the Link and Krebs cycle in order to produce more of these NADH and another molecule called FADH2.